Take your Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's a joy to have with us today Ken and Elaine Terry as well. I mentioned them at the Sunday School Hour. They uh, worked with Brother Carsey's for many years, and when I came in, they actually stayed. And they worked with me for many years. They live up in Tennessee, I think, right? And uh, they are back to visit, and I'm, I'm sure you've had time to enjoy being with the Carsey's as well. So I... Uh, uh, it's been a special day. For those that are joining us online, I uh, greet you. I uh, pray that you will uh, reach out to us, uh, any of our church family. We are uh, trying our best to stay on top of who's ill and uh, uh, to lovingly, f- from a distance, be able to pray for you. And uh, I feel like, uh, I think Sheila and I have said this, and I think Pastor Peterman's with me. It seems like right now our, our prayer life is just engulfed with praying for hurting people uh, in our life. And uh, yet that's a, a wonderful calling that God has given us as pastors that we sometimes know a lot that you know. And then we know more personal, private requests as well. So we want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you and uh, especially any that can't be with us uh, because of sickness um, and uh, with that said, let's pray, and then I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to read Second Timothy chapter 3. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you with hearts that rejoice even in the midst of trials. Uh, we are very much conscious of the fact that our times are in thy hand. And so, Lord, we uh, don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we do know you ordered and authored this day. And it is the day that we worship you. I pray for our nation today. As we every Sunday take time, we pray for all those that are in authority. Father, we desperately need men and women in places of leadership that genuinely are born again. And not those that are given to the ways of the wicked that we continue to see being legislated in this nation. Lord, I know that as a nation, we are calling upon ourselves your judgment, but I pray for your mercies. I pray for our president and vice president and those that are in Congress and in the state of Florida, the governor and and, uh, uh, the houses in Tallahassee. We pray for our own city and all those that are in positions of leadership. Lord, we do not pray them ill, but we do pray that you would bring down conviction uh, upon the, those desires that are contrary to your way. I pray for your church. We live in a day that we're being tested and tried. And are we going to be true? Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to stand where you stand on matters of, of moral uh, obligation? Lord, may we, uh, as your people, with the word of God... May we recognize that we do have the moral authority for the things that we say and do within the bounds of your will and your word. And so, Lord, thank you for your truth. I uh, pray today as we now turn our thoughts uh, to the scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. uh, Father, that we'll be very much convicted that as we read the scripture, we are reading a prophecy of the church of the last days. Lord, may we not be numbered among those apostate souls that deny truth, either with their lips or with their living. Lord, may we be numbered among those that adhere to your word, that we are passionate about the gospel and passionate about the need to follow the principles and the precepts of your word. And so, Lord, I pray, even as has already been prayed this morning, You'll convict where conviction's needed. You'll encourage where encouragement is needed. Uh, Lord, that you will uh, find that compassion and mercies that your Holy Spirit can tend to that is needed in the hearts and lives of those that are here or maybe others that are listening online. And so, Lord, be honored in this moment now. I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. And the teaching of it in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and we're going to read from God's Word, beginning to read at verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 7. 
will not cover all this this morning, but at least it'll set the context for our study. So 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, reading through verse 7. Now let's read together. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you so much. You can be seated. I hope that you have the outline that was available as you came in this morning. And uh, the title of the message is Preaching to the Church of the Last Days. Now, we go verse by verse in the scriptures this morning. And so we are following from 2 Timothy chapter 2, where we were last week, going into 2 Timothy chapter 3 this week. Just so, uh, as a word of reminder, this is one of the prison epistles. In fact, it is the last will and testament of Paul. It is the letter that he is sending to a young preacher. He is the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And the urgency in the letter is that Paul realizes that he is on death row. In fact, he will write right later over in the fourth chapter. He knows that his time of departure is at hand. And he desires so much that Timothy would make his way to Rome where he is in prison. And where he will, I believe after a few months of writing this letter, that Paul will die a martyr. Now, as you have your Bible this morning, I told the Sunday school hour that was in here, we were studying Proverbs 14, and there were a lot of things in that passage that were bad news. And I said, if you think this is bad news, wait until we get to the morning hour. And so that's where we find ourselves. And I wanted to give you a little bit of the background of this. So just a reminder, Timothy was a believer Raised in a godly home. Now, we know the Bible says that his father was a Greek. It does not indicate that he knew the Lord. But it does tell us that his mother and his grandmother were godly women, women of faith. And we find, as we read the scriptures, that they had taught Timothy the scriptures. And so Timothy is a man that is wise not only because he had been in the company of Paul, but he is wise because he had been raised by godly parents, godly mother, and a godly grandmother. Now, just another word of review. We shared with you over the last couple of weeks that there are three metaphors in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that define and describe the pastor's ministry, as well as, I would say, the servant's ministry. The first one was this, that a pastor is to be a workman. I believe it's not just the pastor, but I believe that it is the believer. All of us who desire to serve the Lord, it should be found in our life that we are workers. We're hard workers. We're students of the Word. We're sentinels. We are observing like guards the culture that we're living in. And we're wanting with all of our heart to guard those that we love from the wickedness of the culture of the latter days. So not only do we have the workmen, we also shared with you verses 20 through 21 in 2 Timothy 2, that the pastor and those who would serve the Lord are called to be vessels, honorable vessels, usable vessels, clean vessels, vessels without defilement. And then finally, we're called to be servants. In fact, verse 22 through 26, servants with a pure heart. Now that brings us to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me introduce it to you in this way. What I have given you in chapter 2 is the backdrop. It's the foundation now 
of the challenge that we're going to see in chapter 3. What we will see here in this chapter then, on this PowerPoint, it describes not only the world, but the character and the nature of the church in the latter days. In other words, as you and I look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 2, and now we're coming to chapter 3, Paul's not writing about the world. He's writing about the church. And so those awful sins that we were just reading in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that whole litany of wickedness that we find beginning in verse 2 and going all the way down through verse 7, that's the church. Imagine how bad the world is in the midst of the church. I mean, the church in the midst of the world. The world we know. I mean, we watch the news. We watch, we read the papers, if you still read a paper. But we, we, we're on the internet. We're looking at the news of the world. And we look at America and we say, wow, things are really getting bad. You know, you wonder what the next law for wickedness is going to be passed in this nation. But that's not our problem. We live in the culture. But our problem is what's within the church. And are we the body that Christ would have us to be? And so I'm going to give you a word of caution as we go through this. When I read verse, and you read with me, beginning at verse 1 and going through verse 7, it sounds like we're reading the news headlines today. Go back with me. You have your Bible there for a moment. This isn't on the PowerPoint, but, but just look at some of the things that we find here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 2, lovers of their own selves. How many of you have ever heard of a selfie? All right. Or, or duck lips. Have you heard of duck lips, any of you? No? You ever see that? Sometimes you look at what people post, right? And I'm banned from Facebook, so I don't see it now anymore. But, but people post things, and you wonder, what were they thinking when they put that out there? That ugly picture of you is going to be out there forever. Are you kidding me? But you know, people don't see themselves as we see them. One of the hardest things, I had someone, I don't know if Nell's here this morning, but I post a daily video, and uh, on some, I, I can snap a picture of that day, whatever I'm wearing, for that video. And she, uh, Nell said to me last week, well, you don't smile, you need to smile. I would smile until I realized my smile goes crooked on me. And I've got enough vanity that I don't want to put a crooked smile out there, all right? And all I can think of is, I'm getting old. You know, and so the smile that used to go up, now it sags. So there you go. So anytime you see a smile and you think pastor's frowning, just say, no, that's his smile. It's just upside down now. All right. Now, going back, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, covetous, desiring what others have. Is that in our culture? Oh, yeah. I'm going to flip hamburgers and I deserve $15 for doing that, flipping that hamburger, right? Everybody's covetous. They're wanting more and more and more. Uh, we, uh, boasters. We had a president that was a boaster. Did you ever hear of him? President Trump, right? Proud. Blasphemers. You can't turn the television on and watch anything anymore without blasphemy. In fact, blasphemy has become the comedy of this century. Would you say disobedient to parents? Is that in the culture? Yeah, all of these things are in the culture. And yet it's not the culture that Paul's writing about. He's writing about the church. And so another thought then that goes with this, Paul is describing in 2 Timothy 3, not only the world that was to come, but the nature and character of the church. And so 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1 through 9, we'll study the, the balance of it next week. It is a prophetic portrait of the church of the last days. Not, the, not America, not the world. It's the church that Paul is writing about. And with that said, let's look at verse 1. This know, 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, this know or understand also that in the last days, that time preceding the second coming of Christ, perilous 
times shall come. Now, notice on your outline then, the, the character of the last days. They are the last days that precede the second coming of Christ. We are, as the church, observing the last days. We are in the midst of a culture that is decaying. The family is eroding. Marriage is considered obsolete. And as a result of losing the family foundation of this nation, we are losing our nation itself. Notice also then, and not only the character of the last days, but notice the last days will be perilous. Again, I go back to verse 1. This no. Now the word no there is an imperative. It, it is Paul writing and he said, now be certain. Realize this. Don't be surprised and don't be shaken. This no, Timothy, that also now, the idea of also now know this. So this know also that in the last days, the final time, the latter end of the ages, perilous times shall come. The idea of perilous is difficult, dangerous, grievous, violent times. It carries the concept of a time in which wicked men will rule. We live in that time. Now, another thought then that goes with this, a perilous time shall come. What is the peril? Well, it is the growing wickedness of the society itself. So, Timothy, as you're reading my letter, and understand that there's already this rise of persecution, and there's already enemies within the church itself, understand that this is the nature of the times. Perilous times shall come. And then the question, number two for your outline, is what about the character then of the church? And with that, I'm going to invite you. I don't believe this is on the PowerPoint. But would you turn with me to Revelation chapter 3 in order to know what the church is going to be like besides what we find revealed in 2 Timothy 3. Let's look at Revelation chapter 3. And I want us to focus on for a few moments on the church of Laodicea. Now, the church of Laodicea, of the seven churches of the Revelation, the, the church of Laodicea is the church of the last days. And so, follow with me as I read Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading at verse 14, and I'm going to read down through verse 20. You follow as I'm reading right now. So, this is the church of the last days, prophetically, as we find it in Revelation. Revelation 3, verse 14. And unto the angel, or the messenger, of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the, amen, the fine, faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. And so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And yet knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me of gold tried in the fire. That is pure gold, uncompromised is what he's calling the church to be. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, not rich in the things of this world, but the rich, in the things, rich in the things that are of God and eternal. Verse 18 again. That thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy wickedness, thy nakedness, uh, do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. see. As many as I love... I rebuke and I chasten, chasten for their sins. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Let me take you through this. Here's the first thought. 
The church at Laodicea was an apostate church. In fact, as you read verses 15 or 14 through 20, you see absolutely no evidence of regeneration. In other words, this is a church in membership, but it is not the bride of Christ. This is a church that was going through the formalities of religion, but they were not the true church. Can I say this to you this morning? The majority of churches in America are Laodicean churches. The gospel is not preached, and the laws and the commandments and the principles and the precepts of God's word are minimized. We live in a culture in America that most churches are intent on entertaining and being exciting. But God's word would have us to be a church that is intent on being holy and dedicated to him. Notice about this church, if you would, then. Not only is it a church that shows no evidence of regeneration, but secondly, it is a church that's members were spiritually lukewarm. I want to give you four traits or qualities or characteristics of a lukewarm church. Let's go back to the Bible again. Uh, Revelation 3, verse uh, 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Four things. Number one, this is an in, indifferent church. Indifferent church. Their works, their deeds were neither cold nor hot. Now, I could go into a whole uh, description about Laodicea and the waters, and I preached that before. But the fact is, Laodicea was known for having waters uh, to drink that were putrid. Uh, there were waters that came through an aqueduct. The aqueduct ran underground, and it was said when the waters finally arrived in Laodicea, they smelled horribly. They were such that you would not want to drink it. They were not cold enough, like a spring to have fresh water, but they weren't hot enough to take a bath. They were almost worthless, if you would. Now look again with me at, at that verse 15. Their works then are neither cold nor hot. So we're not talking about water. We're talking about choices. In other words, here's a church that did not have a passion for the Lord. They were a lukewarm, hypocritical, indifferent, self-righteous church. They had absolutely no sense of their own spiritual condition. They were indifferent. And then look again at verse 17. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And so they were an affluent church. Laodicea was known to be a city that was a very wealthy city. And as a result of that, it would be obvious that probably the wealth of that area would also be evident within the church. Now, here's American culture and sadly, American Christianity. We have for too long enjoyed our comforts. Right? We have. Generally speaking, most of us would not be considered poor. We have jobs, we have incomes, we have houses, we have uh, our, our means of transportation. Uh, we have much. And what has happened, I think, in the American culture, in the churches, is that because we have so much, we feel God's blessed us. Or is it that we're simply blessed because we live in a culture that has allowed us to earn an income and have a means of providing? In other words, I'm saying to you, because you're rich and prosperous, doesn't mean that you're blessed by God. I say, oh, I feel blessed. Well, what about your neighbor who's wicked and lost, and they've got a bigger house than you do? Would you say, well, God's blessed them too? Absolutely, you would. But it doesn't mean that because I have much, it's indicative that I'm spiritual. And I think we confuse our prosperity with our spirituality. And I'm suggesting to you, they're not one of the same. 
Now, notice also then, they were indifferent, affluent. Number three, they were also insensitive. Insensitive. We read again in verse 17. Thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, I don't have time to develop that. But you and I would look at verse 17 and say, how could you be all those things and not even know it? Well, the same way that some of us might be here this morning and we are ill. You know, it's always amazing to me. You go to the doctor one day and your whole life changes because you've been diagnosed with something you didn't even know you had. Now, we pray that that won't happen to us for a long, long time. I told my lovely wife, if I die before I'm 70, she is rich. If I die after I'm 70, well, not so rich, baby. Not so rich, you know. My point, go back to this here, the insensitivity. None of us know our true health. We really don't. We're doing, hopefully you're doing everything you can to be healthy. And so go back to verse 17. Here's a church that is spiritually sick. And it doesn't even know it. Thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, Blind and naked. You know why? Because their affluence has made them desensitized to their true spiritual emptiness. And then notice again, not only indifferent, affluent, insensitive, but the fourth characteristic of the church of the last days is apathetic. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. I stand at the door and knock. Now, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Could you move that forward one slide, please? Now, this is a famous painting. And one of the things that probably you know, there's not a doorknob on the outside of that house. A lot of people have used that on tracks over the years for uh, unsaved people. So you may have seen it on the track and given it to other people to encourage them to come and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. But the problem with the portrait is that this isn't the door to an unsaved man or woman's home. This is the door to the church at Laodicea. And so in this picture here and in the prophetic description that we have in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, it's not that the Lord is knocking on the door of the lost. He's knocking on the door of the church. And that church is so busy about their religion that they don't even realize that they've excluded the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, I ask you this morning, we live... In the latter days. But the question is, of which church are you a member? Of which congregation do you belong? Are we the apostate church? And we're indifferent, we're fluent, we're insensitive, apathetic, and the Lord's outside knocking. And we're so busy about what we're doing. We don't have time for the Lord. I'm afraid there's a lot of church members like that across America. And I'm afraid there might be some even in our church. And raising our young people in this God-forsaken culture that we're living in now, or the culture that has forsaken God, and it's going to be very easy for you to lose your kids to the world and them still be in church. And yet, not even realize that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, let's continue with this thought then. So here's the sum of the culture within the church. I invite you to go back with me to 2 Timothy 3 now. The sum of the culture in the church is spiritually indifferent, blinded by their wealth, insensitive to their spiritual condition, and spiritually apathetic. And I have a question. Well, really, four questions for you. The first would be this. Have I become spiritually indifferent? 
When's the last time that your heart was moved by the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit? When's the last time that you felt a yearning and a thirst for the Lord? Another question would be, have I associated my material successes with God's blessings and His approval? Number three, am I humble enough to honestly examine my own spiritual condition? Am I, am I that humble? Be like me sitting in front of my computer snapping the picture before I put it on the internet with my devotional. And I have to snap it four and five times because of that ugly mug that's looking back at me. Now, I don't think about the ugly mug until I look at it. And it's looking at me. And I think we go through life spiritually the same way. I wonder if the Lord took an x-ray of your heart, what it would show. And then fourthly, do I lack spiritual zeal and have become spiritually apathetic? You know, one of the things about being in a ministry this long now is that I remember you. I remember some of you when you first came to know Christ as Savior. I remember when you joined the church. I remember when you were a teenager and now your children are teen. I remember you. I remember you walking the aisle at the wilds. I remember you walking the aisle at Tom Farrell's revival meeting. By the way, Tom has been given less than eight months now to live. So uh, there's a gathering for preachers with him, but he is... He is passing within a few months, but he's ready. But I, what I'm saying is, I remember you. I, I remember some of you who are grandparents. When you were parents, you were dropping your children off for teen activities. I remember you. And I remember some of you are not what you used to be. You see, it's easy to absorb the culture. If we're not careful, let me take you now. Second Timothy chapter three. And I, I want to introduce and this is really just an introduction of what's going to follow. And then I'm going to cover three points. But here's what we're going to study in second Timothy chapter three. And it is a description of the moral depravity within the church. Let me give those to you. You're going to find in verses two through four that there is a heresy or a culture of selfishness or self-love. In verse 5, there's a prevalence of hypocrisy that is in the church. Of verses 6 and 7, that there will be some who will lead away the spiritually weak. And then finally, verses 8 through 9, there will literally be within the church itself those who oppose the truth. Hard to believe, but that is going to be the culture that we're going to see. Now, on your outline, let me cover in the time I have uh, before Eric says that's it. Let me cover four sinful characteristics, okay? So there, are, there will be 18 total, but here is the first one. Again, now, look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 2. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. In other words, a heresy of self-love. Let me, uh, just for the sake of time, d describe that to you. What does it mean to be a lover of oneself? It means to be self-centered or self-serving. It means to be selfish or uh, intent on one's own interest. It means to be self-focused and insensitive to the needs of others. Lovers of their own selves. I, I thought about a, a couple of modern philosophies of this world. There's one philosophy that says you have to love yourself before you can love others. You ever heard that one? You got to love you. Do you does, is there anyone here that thinks it's a problem loving yourself? Number two, yeah, you can never love others until you love yourself. Kind of the same thing, a little bit different. Here's another. I got to be me. I got to be free. I, 
I, I. Now here's what's happening to churches. We have churches just like Hillsdale that are consumed with, I got to be me, I got to be free. And they preach the grace of God without preaching sanctification. The grace of God is his unmerited love and favor, right? But God has also called us to be holy, set apart, not in step with the world that we live in. And so what kind of believer are you? Now, what did the Lord teach us? Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do you remember the, the uh, lawyer, young lawyer, he came to the Lord and, and he began to talk to the Lord about the greatest commandment? Do you remember that passage? In Matthew 22 and verse 37, the Lord says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, not thyself, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. The world says you got to love yourself. God says, no, you got to love me. And then the world says, well, I'll love the Lord and then I'm going to love me. Oh, no. Then it says, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the culture has been so deceiving that even the church itself is beginning to mouth the philosophy of the world that we live in. And so in the last days, let me describe for you what I think the sins of self-love are in our culture, in the church today. Husbands become more concerned with their happiness than their wives. Fathers sacrifice the well-being of their children for pleasures and possessions. Wives will resent putting the needs of their family before their own desires and pleasures. And children who are never satisfied. It's the last days. And it's true of the church. Let me take you back. 2 Timothy chapter 3 again in verse 2. And we're going to notice that there's the second sin that's found here. And it's the sin of covetousness. We read in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And then going with that and closely related to that is covetous. Why? Well, if I love myself, my first desire is to please myself. And in order to please myself, it's my desire to have what I want. And that has become the nature of the culture we live in. I, I would say this. I, I've watched in these last oh, 20 years a shift. The generation before this one, the one that Larry Carsey's pastored, and even the one that I pastored, their parents would do everything they could to sacrifice to have their kids in a Christian school. But this culture today within the church will sacrifice their kids for nice vacations, bigger homes, nicer cars. There has been a shift away from the Lord and not even knowing it. Covetousness, men who love money. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, literally, the love of money or the love of silver is the root of all evil. And then I'd invite you to notice again, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous. And then the word boasters, arrogant, self-exalting, bragging. And I, a couple of thoughts that go with this. Uh, they see themselves as better than others. They fail to see God's grace as the source of what they are and possess. Appreciate it, Brother Larry's testimony up here. We are nothing apart from God's grace. Anything good that can be said of us and our lives is God's grace. Why? Because we deserve nothing. Nothing at all do we deserve. And so boasters, they see themselves better than others. They fail to see God's grace as the source of what they are. And number three, we have nothing and nothing apart from God's grace. Proverbs 27 and verse 1. Boast not. Thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Romans 11 and verse 18, 
boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You say, what in the world does that mean? It's the picture is of a fruit tree, right? And the fruit's hanging on the tree, hanging out here off the branches. And the fruit is boasting and saying, look at how sweet I am. Look at how inviting I am. And, and, the, and the illustration is, wait a minute, you're nothing without the root. That is who we are in Christ. Without Christ, we're nothing. Any good that could be said of us, we are the fruit that's hanging at the end of the branch, which is rooted in Jesus Christ. And then uh, another thought that goes with that, I'm going to move on, uh, the proud. 2 Timothy 3, again, verse 2, men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, and proud. Let me give you three characteristics of pride. Number one, arrogance. Arrogance. Proverbs 20 and verse 6 we read, Men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. I, I've shared with you before when I was 12 years old, and I was a good kid. I really was. I know you may not believe that, but I was a good kid. Take my word for it. I was a good kid, all right? At least my grandmother said I was a good kid. All right. My point is this. The preacher that led me to Christ, and to get me lost before I could get saved. He had to get me from seeing that I was good enough to seeing that there was nothing good about me. For all have sinned, right? And come short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous. No, not one. And so that pastor that sat down in my little family room there. He had to lead me to see who I was, not in my opinion, but in God's eyes. And you know, I ended up being a filthy, rotten sinner. One whom God loved. Because God commended and demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at the verse again. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. You know, if, if anybody ever says anything good about you, you should be very thankful that they don't know the worst. Think about that for a moment. But a faithful man, honest man who can find. I don't know about you, but in this culture I'm living in, I find very few that I would consider honest. You agree? Number two, the second characteristic of a proud Individual is arrogance. Number two is unteachable. Unteachable. Uh, too proud to see our faults. And too proud to accept correction. Here's a verse. Proverbs 12, 15. And we studied it this morning, I believe. The way of a fool is right, morally justified in his own opinion, his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Here's the problem of the culture you're living in. The culture we're living in now says everything goes. There are no absolutes. There are no rights and wrongs. There's no such thing as sin. That's the culture you're living in. And as a result of that, this culture keeps getting worse and worse. More wicked than we could ever have imagined even 10 years ago. And the church keeps moving. Oh, we're far enough behind that we're not like them. But we're going that way. A sense of being unteachable. And then thirdly, contentious. So the proud, what are they? They are arrogant. They are unteachable. And then they are contentious. This is the church of the last days now. The, the thought then of this pride, Proverbs 13 and verse 10, only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised, the well-counseled is wisdom. Let me ask you, if the culture of the world is proud. The culture of the church of the last days is proud. But what about you? Are you given to pride? 
Proverbs 28 and verse 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord, I love this ending, shall be made fat. Now the word fat there is to prosper, okay? But as you look at that, the proud heart stirs up strife. So what about the church of the last days? It's proud, it's arrogant, and it's unteachable. I'm going to close with one verse. I'm looking and saying, man, is that the high side? Is he's going to just leave and walk out, you know? Let me close with this verse. Let's go back to it. Next slide, please. We have here in Revelation 3, verse 20, as I've already shared with you, a picture or a portrait of the Lord outside the door, not of a house, but of a church. And one can imagine with the church of Laodicea, they were doing all that churches do, right? Going through the steps, following the schedule, showing up when it's time. They were a religious group. But they're a group that did not have room for Christ. I ask you this morning, most of you all here as believers, have you made a room for Christ? Or have you given him entrance into your heart and into your life? One thing I've learned in life is this, that our Lord will accept no place but the first place. He will rule from our heart's throne or he will not rule at all. The church at Laodicea was a church spiritually on the outside. It all appeared dressed up and well. But on the inside, they were spiritually dead and dying. I ask you, what kind of believer are you this morning? Anyone that might be listening online and maybe someone here this morning. The picture of the Lord standing at the door and knocking is one that he's wanting entrance to a, a church. But I do encourage you this morning. that Just as I, at 12 years old, gave him entrance into my heart. He wants entrance into yours as well. The Lord who knocks on our heart's door loved us and he died for us. He paid the penalty of our sins that his blood might be our redemption. Do you know him as Savior? It's about an eyes closed. Our Father, as we bow the close of this service this morning, I pray for anyone that might be listening online or maybe someone that's sitting here even in this auditorium and they are in the culture that might be like I was as a teenager and, and loved by their parents and loved by their grandparents and, and spiritually religious and yet not know you as Savior. And I pray for that lost soul. I, I pray that in this hour, in this moment, at this time, that they would realize what you have said regarding them. That there is none good. No, not one. That there is none that are righteous and that all have sinned. Right now, that they would ask you to forgive them of their sin and they trust you as their Savior. And so, Lord, I pray, I pray right now for anyone that's here, or anyone that's listening online, that with their heads bowed and their hearts open before you, they would say, oh God, forgive me for the sins I've committed. And I accept Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins, was buried and he rose again. And I ask him to be my Savior. Lord, I pray for your church today. And, and there may be somebody who's listening online. They're a, a member of an apostate church. They have watched that church drift far from truth. 
Lord, I would pray they would find somewhere that they can go that the truth is still preached without any apology. And Lord, I pray for our church here. It's possible to be in a Hillsdale Baptist church and be drifting far from you. It's possible to raise kids in a culture and those kids not share any of our values, any of our longings, any of our desires because they do not know you. I pray, Lord, would you protect Hillsdale Baptist Church from the drift of this world? And yet, Lord, you will only do that as we dedicate our families to you. And so, Lord, there might be some men, some women here today, maybe some teenagers here today, that they need to come back to you. Now, they need to dedicate themselves and remember the Christ they once loved. The word that they once read. And Lord, that they restore that passion and that longing to follow you. So Lord, bless right now. We're going to stand in a moment. And we're going to sing. And, and Lord, it would be my longing and my desire that there would be many of us that would bow before you and say, Lord, I humble myself. Lord, I ask that you protect me and my family from the drift of this culture. And Lord, help me to be a testimony in a lost world. Now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I'm going to ask you this morning, was there one during this message that you thought, those are qualities in my life that I'm not happy with? That church and its pride and its boasting and its selfishness. And I find I'm too much like that myself. And maybe this morning you'd say, the pastor God spoke to me. And I know there's some areas of my life I need to remove. I don't want to be like the church of the last days. I want to be loving and dedicated to the Lord. Would you make that decision this morning? Maybe someone here and you'd say, Pastor, I, I, I trust the Lord as my Savior while you were praying. Would you come? When we stand in a moment, and Pastor Peterman's going to sing. The rest of us are going to sing with him with our heads bowed. But as God's speaking to your heart, that you would step out and say, Pastor, the Lord spoke to me today. Today, I, I asked him to be my Savior. Would you do that? Let's stand. Father. You bless this invitation now as we sing and our heads are bowed and not looking around. But Lord, we're singing just as I am without one plea. And Lord, that would be our desire that we would come to you just as we are. So Lord, stir our hearts right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Pastor Peterman's going to lead us, but you sing there. And I'm here at the front. I would love to meet you as you make that decision. Either as a believer or to trust Christ as Savior. Would you come right now? It's about eyes closed, but let's sing together.